Welcome to episode 67 of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host, Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. And on this week's show, we have a coaching legend of the game, a career that spanned over 50 years and is still going. Uh, his name is Dave Titmus, um, otherwise known as Coach T. He started off his days uh, back, uh, well... Going back in his in his early twenties, uh, coaching basketball, um, after a, a leg injury, saw him make the switch from from playing to coaching, which we'll hear all about. And since then, has pretty much done it all. Whether it's coaching in the national league back in the league's heyday uh, with Ovaltine Hemel Hempstead, um, to the BBL uh, with Worthing Thunder and Thames Valley, uh, and of course also spending time. Um, on a different side of the game with the Great Britain Wheelchair Basketball Association coaching the GB uh, Paralympic team at uh, Paralympics as well as World Championships. He's got a wealth of experience um, which we went into in all of this whether it is with the clubs or also with the national teams where he did times with with England and uh, GB. He's won titles, uh, he's won medals, uh, you name it, he's done it. So super privileged to get him on the show this week and uh, it was a very, very good, enjoyable conversation which I'm sure anyone, especially aspiring coaches, will enjoy listening to. Before we do get into this week's show, please take two seconds to check out our Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash hoopsfix, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash H-O-O-P-S-F-I-X. There you can sign up to give us a monthly contribution of as much or as little as you'd like to help us do the work that we're doing we cannot do it without your support please go and check it out and consider giving the price of a cup of tea a cup of coffee every single month if you're listening on iTunes, please take two seconds to give us a rating and review. Uh, we just reached 80 uh, ratings, so it's much appreciated. If you can add a review in there as well, it would be even more appreciated. If you're watching on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up and a comment. Uh, let's get some discussion going. If you want to reach out to me privately, drop me an email, sam at hootfix.com, or you can hit me up on every single social media platform at Hootfix. Anyway, here is this week's show with Dave Titmus. Coach, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you, Sam. So uh, there's a lot to a lot to cover in this. Obviously, you've you've been involved with the game for decades upon decades, about 50 years uh, as a coach. Um, and the place to always start is the beginning for me. Um, so I'd love to hear sort of your your early exposure to basketball, how you first got involved uh, with the game. Yeah, I, I mean, I was a um, 15-year-old. I was living in Surrey, and I was soccer mad. I was a goalkeeper. I was a county goalkeeper level. But then we moved to Boreham Wood, my family, and I went to school there, and the PE teacher, would you believe, was a guy called Tony Smith, who um, was the GB Olympic coach in 1964. Um, and... I saw the game. I was soccer mad, but then I, I, I just saw this game that I'd never seen before up until that point. And I don't know, Sam, but something happened. Something happened. And within six weeks, two months, I never played soccer again. And within a year and a half, I, I was in what was then the schoolboy national team. We had a, a, I don't know what, it must have been about under 18 or something uh, as a player. Um, but the Tony's influence, um, he was a fundamentalist and um, he, his enthusiasm, I think you always look to figures in your life, don't you, that that really influenced you. And and that's how I um, that's how I got introduced to the game. And I, I just love playing. I don't know whether being a goalkeeper, I had hands. So it, it, but it was just something I, I, I just have never been. I can still smell the gym. I can still smell the leather ball, you know, amazing. And so there was obviously a transition at some point from playing to coaching. You know, how, how far yeah. did you take the playing and at what point did the transition come to coaching? I'm pretty sure it was an injury that ended up sort of leading to the first exposure to coaching. But can you kind of go through that with us? Yeah, that exactly. Um, I, I played at sort of county league level for, um, for, for a little while, obviously after I left school. Um, I went into journalism. Um, that was my first job, but I still had this inkling for basketball. So I, I, I played a, li a, a little, but I got a dreadful knee uh, injury, um, which would probably these days be like a, maybe a, a, a season ending, but you'd come back from it sort of thing. But in that period, my, my kid brother, John, his, his, um, 
PE teacher asked me to go in and coach their school team. <laughs> and again, uh, talk about experiences that 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 changed. There's something happened there. I coached um, and I you know, coached what I knew from having played under Tony Smith at school. And it was then that it's kind of sparked. I realized that, that I loved it. I love teaching. I love coaching. Um, I think in some way I call myself a teaching coach. And that experience then, although I was able to recover and I missed about, you know, in county league sort of stuff as a player, but coaching was it. That That's all I wanted to do. And that started me on a, a path. I realized I was going to have to study the game. I needed to know more. The game was not like it is today in this country, by the way. So, but that's how it, that's how it happened. And so, so how old were you when you, when you went into your, your brother's school to, to coach? I must have been uh, 22, something like that. So pretty young. And at that point, you decided this is what you wanted to do. Yeah, yes. I, and I was aware, actually, that I was young as a coach, you know, because I was coaching people older than me, quite, like at the club level. I was coaching people older than me uh, and so on. But, but I, uh, you know, I had a sound footing in the fundamentals, but I, I had, I didn't understand the bigger, the other elements of the game, which obviously I went on to, to study. So, um, uh, I mean, I'm 74 now, so that that seems a long time ago, you know. So, so you're 22 years old, you've decided, you know, you've come across coaching and you've decided that this is, you know, this is your calling and this is what you love to do. How did you, how did you approach it? Like, what were the steps that you took as a young aspiring coach to kind of try to, I guess, improve, improve your knowledge, improve your skills, uh, put yourself in a position to be able to succeed as a coach? Well, at that time, because things changed later, but I think we're going to go on and talk about that, but at that time, the Basketball um, Association, bless them, uh, were, were the, the process for basketball. It, 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 people were evangelical about the game, had to be evangelical. But so they created this sort of system of um, uh, having somebody, it was Brian Coleman actually, going, going around all over the country. You know, I think he did it for about 10 years, running courses, running courses, different levels of courses. But most of the people doing those things, uh, tutoring, um, and I got myself on everything I could, absolutely everything I could. They were from teaching backgrounds predominantly. So you learned a lot about group management and teaching styles, coaching styles, um, about the simplicity of the game. Uh, well, a game that was simple on one level but had complexities on another, you know. But you did, that, that's what I got from those things. But nothing about I never learned how to be a professional head coach for instance you know uh, but what it did do was um, make me understand the value of practice of preparation um, of creating an environment how you create an environment so I'm very grateful actually to those and and of course I, I went on to, to tutor well, I don't know, it's over 1,500, I think, um, uh, coaches uh, in various levels of, of coaching awards. Things have changed and improved since then, though. When you talk about sort of the lay of the land of the game um, in that era when you, when you first started getting involved with the coaching side, could you see a route to becoming a professional coach or did you accept that it was going to have to try and be something that you'd do on the side around having a, a full-time job as well? No, you're absolutely right. No, I... Um, I mean, uh, as a as a player, uh, I mean, my my uh, Tony had put me into the national, put me into the Baltimore Bullets in the original National League, about a six team, uh, a six team league. And when you when I looked at that, and and there was nobody, uh, or very, I can't think of many people who were playing, who were coaching professionally in that in those early, in early days. There there may have been, but I, honestly. No, I, I, I thought um, that I would hang in here, you know, that I that I would try and do it. Um, but actually, for many years from my coaching career, I've often had to do other things, even things I didn't want to do, you know, uh, even when I got into the game professionally. 
um, in order to coach, you, you know, um, and it, and it's still today. I'm I, I'm I'm saddened actually by by um, some of re, you know some really talented guys looking around to say, well, where could I coach? And I felt that I you know that maybe going to the going to the states because we all looked to the west in those days, you know, for the get for um, development in the game that maybe that was going to be um, a route. But I was still caught up in the way the game was. Well, frankly, it was growing. It was growing pretty well. I mean, so it looked like there may be opportunities. And indeed, of course, that's that's what happened. So what was your 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 first uh, sort of involvement with a club on a club level coaching um, and kind of, I guess, you know, dipping your toes in the water on that side of things? Well, that that in terms of national league level, really, which was the you know the burgeoning national league, it was very competitive. You had a tournament to even get into it that you had to win, but that was with uh, a club that we set up at Hemel. I was I came into Hemel uh, called Hemel Lakers. We were originally I like uh, they were called something else, Hemel Hornets, I think. But um, when we got into the national league, I liked the name Lakers anyway. The committee decided we would be Hemel Lakers. We played in, um, we coached, uh, I coached them in the London League because we, we were too good for the county league sort of thing. Um, and, and we got into the National League Division 2. I shall never forget it because we had to play in a qualifying tournament, um, which was, um, you know, fantastic. And the National League was the aspiration at that time. And then we had a, the most amazing um uh, quali- um, promotion game at at Hemel against Leeds, against actually being coached by Dave Ransom, of course, who eventually was my assistant uh, as a coach. Anyway, we we pack, we had fourteen hundred people at that at that time in that gym, and we and we uh, got into Division One, and that was when things really took off in in terms of. From that point to the to getting the old team sponsorship, and over a period of about seven years, I mean, I always talk about talk about being thrown in at the deep end. But we went from playing at that level to playing in the European Correct Cup with a fully professional club in about seven years. Wow! It, it, it was an amazing, uh, an amazing time and experience. So when, when we're talking about timelines, this was um, sort of mid to mid to late seventies, going into the into the early eighties, right? Um, yeah. You know, when I speak to people from kind of that era, and they speak about the, they speak so highly of where basketball was culturally. Um, you know, within England, sort of the yes. crowds, the, the level of sponsorship that could be raised. You know, Channel Four being involved, all, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. What do you think about it? Like, it's interesting when I when I look at the game today, and you know, people just say basketball uh, is is perceived as an American sport in England. You know, culturally, it can't it can't penetrate into the mainstream media and stuff. But it seems like back then it did. So it's like what which means it's possible in England, like it is possible because football still existed back then, you know, cricket still existed back then. So it's like, yeah. what was it back then that was different to what we have today and what we've had for the last couple of decades where it's been very hard for basketball to sort of break through into, into being a little bit more mainstream? Yeah, well, I, 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 well obviously the TV deal, deal with Channel 4 um, was enormous. I mean, that, that, that expect, every Monday night... There was a live game from something I mean, we had them at, at Hamel. Um, there were there were and also um, there were a lot of personalities um, on the floor um, that I think that people began to identify with, and it was the first time we saw uh, moving out of the mainstream. I, my thought at that time was: listen, all all we need now. Is to get on the back pages of of um, the national of national press. Then we know we, we would have arrived, but we were kicking against the um, traditional sports: soccer, cricket, um, rugby. And I, and I, I think it, it had a sort of a novelty a novelty value, but a lot of good people um, were involved uh, in marketing and pushing the game, and there wasn't element that if you could just get them in the gym if you get people into the gym 
the reaction was always the same. Oh, I never knew it was like that. Oh, that was bad. You've got a scoreboard with ticking down two scores. Go all of the things, the exciting things about the game, uh, the family orientation. You know, uh, uh, in terms of audience, and I think soccer was going through. I, I might be wrong, wrong about this, but my recollection was hooliganism and those sorts of problems. You never had that in in uh, in, in basketball. So it was a it was a clean spot. I think it was difficult to put onto television. I think you couldn't, I suppose like a lot of sports, it, it's difficult to capture the sort of atmosphere of, of what a game is, is, is really like when you sit courtside versus watching it on a, on a screen. Obviously, NBA and EuroLeague, they've taken it to another level now. Um, but at that time, and do you know, I, I, I've, I've read countless accounts, even some of my former players, you know, Bobby Kinzer and, um, well, the late um, Larry Dassey now and, and uh, people I was involved with at that time who, who say exactly the same. There were some terrific players around, but the players that would, estab would be established now. Um, I mean, Joe, Joe Pace, I, I recruited a guy, an NBA player, an NBA centre. I don't think there's, I don't think there's ever been, well, the BBL is a guard forward lead now, you know, but the BBL... I'm not sure I'm answering your question. I'm wondering. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, it's all interesting. Um, yeah. Do, 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 do you think that if if uh, the BBL was able to recruit that calibre of player, we're talking about, you know, players that have just been drafted or players that have very, you know, at the moment we do get, obviously London Lions have just signed DeAndre Liggins who, who played in the NBA yeah. just four or five years ago. But if we were able to get sort of players of that level cl close to their prime rather than at the tail end of their career, Irregardless of them being American as opposed to British, do you think that would actually, because the standard of play is so much higher and maybe more exciting, that could potentially help basketball break through? Do you think it is all about the product that's on the floor in terms of the talent of the players? Well, I mean, that's always been... I'm conflicted about this. I just thought actually about Harvey as well. Harvey Knuckles, a, a second-round draft pick player. I went to Los Angeles and we recruited him to Hemel. So that, that, they're... They're serious, you know, they were serious uh, players. But I'm conflicted about this because um, the argument is that if you have American players, it's more, more exciting, more, more personalities, there's a novelty um, area. And to win, um, certainly in, in National League, for instance, to win, uh, you, you quite often have to have, you know, at least two, two, um, two American players. But... I'm conflicted because of the, my national team experience, which I know we'll talk about. But I, I wonder if if we went the other way, <laughs> you know, would would um, unless we could get to a level. But I, I I wonder if supposing we restricted imports quite dramatically uh, and had and re were able to retain some of the I mean just outstanding British uh, talent. Um, that has that's been here, but be be good enough, be be stable enough and commercial enough to be able to ha instead of them going to Europe, perhaps not yet stopping them go to the NBA. They're going to go to the NBA, then you know that's a big payday. But uh, you know if we if we did that, then I, I think the British, um, I don't think it would affect crowds. I I, I think I think. We've got athletic guys, you know. Uh, I, I think it's overrated that that thing, and I, and and it would all be British, British guys, you know. I, I think there's a parallel with soccer. I'm not I'm not into soccer, but you know, people talk about the England about the Premier League and the, the, how foreign many foreign players there are. Um, and I love American players, by the way, because I've I've been I've had some wonderful wonderful players. Um, and personalities, uh, but they are concerned, aren't they? I think about the then the performance of the national team, and in basketball's case, the national team success. Then everybody knows it. Everybody says it. National team success turns things around in, domestically. Hockey, you know, look at hockey. Look at netball. Look at what netball's done. Um, look at any sport. That is suddenly successful. There's always a, uh, and it's 
the, the ridiculous thing is that basketball is an incredible game for this country. You know, it's indoors. <laughs> it's warm, you know, it's family orientated, it's exciting, all of those things. Um, but I would want to see British players. Um, why can't we have a domestic league predominantly made up of British players? Maybe have a, a two-player rule. And I, and I include passport players in, in that, by the way. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, it does seem like over the last few years, there's definitely a greater presence of, of sort of national team guys and high-level British players that are playing playing domestically for the first time. And yeah, obviously, with, with Brexit happening, um, that could also sort of force force the hand a little bit in terms of uh, bringing, bringing more guys home, potentially. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see kind of how, how, how that all plays out. So... You know, when we're talking about sort of the Hemel Lakers and then then uh, becoming Oval Team Hemel Hempstead, you said there that over the course of the seven years, you basically went from uh, I guess amateur to prof- to a sort of fully professional setup. What yeah. would you attribute that um, acceleration uh, of the development of the club to? Like, how did it happen so quickly? Well, I, we had um, we put together teams. You know, we had fantastic uh, volunteers. Uh, that we had built, but we couldn't, you couldn't do it without money. And so uh, the, the, the two biggest things obviously were that we began to attract sponsorships. I mean, the smaller sponsorships as well as uh, Oval Team, which at that time was, um, was a perfect, um, um, perfect, uh, what's the word, partnership. Um, but but also we raised a lot of money. We created and set up a lottery that we ran and developed across the whole of the south of England. And if I tell you that over a period, we're, we're talking about about five million pounds um, being raised, and and half of it went back in in prizes and so on. But uh, but a, a, a lottery that was almost disassociated with the club because we we you know we got a um, news agents to to stock it all over we had full-time staff running it um we got the idea from what was then Sunderland I guess a precursor of Newcastle but Sunderland and uh, and that was it, it was fundraising you know fundraising so we had resources so so what you, you actually set up your own lottery like a like the national lottery, like people would yes. buy tickets with a chance of winning a lump sum of money and then you could take profits out of that, which would help fund the club. Yeah, it was very heavily re- regulated, but um, that it was it was amazing because this was before the national lottery. Yeah, that that killed a lot of these type of lotteries, club lotteries, you know. But of course, the football club, we had Watford up the road. Um, and of course, they were running these sorts of things. But but we had uh, um, we designed our own uh, own um, brand of lottery that wasn't just linked. It was linked to the club, sort of technically. But we realised that the way to uh, to raise money was to develop it across the country. We 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 had agents all over the south of England. I mean, we had people going round in cars, picking money up, you know, and then and then of course. We, we began to sell more and more um, and we were selling a lottery out in a, in a week at one oh. stage, which was incredible. Um, so that amount of money allowed, I mean, myself, we had a, a full-time staff, uh, Roger, Roger Yap, who's a statistician, well-known statistician now, a terrific administrator. He came, you know, was able to come in full-time. I was full-time. But of course, I wasn't full time coach. It it was all around again. In order to coach, I had to work on the commercial side, and I had a background in journalism and and marketing to a certain extent. So, so what, but it what, was on amazing. A, on, really. on the day to day, what were kind of your roles? You know, outside of outside of the coaching, what what other things would you find yourself doing? Um, it, I mean, it was it was running the commercial side I, I the company was I was the managing director so called of the of the the company and uh, Roger took care of the of the basketball um, the administration and um, and also obviously we were recruiting uh, players but I was involved in the commercial aspects 
Uh, a bit like Bob, Bob, Bob Hope was, you know, at Birmingham, Birmingham. I mean, he was far better marketeer than me. That, that's for sure. He was he was incredible. But um, yeah, I, so it was um, that was it during mostly. And then we had the we were bringing in pro, you know, we had pro players. So we then we had a practice. So I'd leave the desk, get changed, go and practice, come back to the desk. It, it, it was it was crazy because it, it at the same time. I was I was learning to be a coach. You know, I was still learning to be a better coach, but I knew that coaching was what I loved. So um, it, it was it was really really hard time, but very very exciting because, I mean, the first Channel Four game we had, we locked out six hundred people. I mean, they were queuing round the round the centre. I should never forget that, and and we had a bank of seating then that went from the floor to the very back of the sports sports hall we had seating at each end and across the other side of the floor i mean it was we broke the regulations you know the fire regulations regularly it it, it, it was it i think the point was that to to compete because of you know the the iconic club was crystal palace everybody wanted to try and emulate but i mean they what they did was absolutely for basketball was fantastic you know it was brilliant and some of the players and so on that came out of that period um i absolutely admire um to to this day you know but they i think the the um the so the model the basketball model we were trying to do that then we were trying to decide were we in the entertainment business and of course when bobby came in he he brought a crowd in on his own, you know. Bobby Kinzer, he he was so charismatic and and such a damn good player. I didn't even realise what I had there as a coach, you know. And of course, a wonderful Larry Dassey. I mean, the late Larry Dassey. He he um um he he just taught me so much, you know. I, I learned a great deal from from these guys. Dave Shelley was the, the one of the best English guards ever, you know, at that time. So it was, it was a, and of course with Channel Four, and there was a real. I really had the sense that one day, I would be the coach, and we'd have a, a commercial director, manager in all the commercial side of the club, like a football club, would grow, and then the the, the, the sports hall would be too small, so we needed better facilities, and obviously that's what's happened to a certain extent in other parts of the country, isn't it? You know, you look at. Newcastle, look at London playing out of the copper box. Oh, it's amazing, you know, from when you look at it through the lens of the 80s, late 80s. Yeah. The um, So what age were you during this during this period when you were, were coaching these guys in, in National League? Uh, you know, I'd have to check that. Give me uh, a roundabout, just a roundabout. It doesn't have to be a specific. No, no. I So I, by then, I was still been I was pretty young. My- I was quite, oh yes, I was, I think 30s, you know, 30s. 30s, and I, I was on a real, I mean, a steep learning curve, to put it, put it mildly, you know, and I, and I couldn't absorb, it, the, the sort of commercial work and um, promotional work and stuff, that was all kind of like a bit of an interference, you know, <laughs> but I knew that I had to do it to, to, uh, uh, and apart from one, one period, which I think we'll come on to, um, it, it was something that I pretty much had to do, you know. But yeah, I was young, and but I was thrown in there, and that, and then I'm, I, I'm we're playing Real Madrid second team in the Corac Cup. Come, on, I mean, come on, uh, in this, in this, uh, their training facility was a ten thousand seater. I mean, come on, you know, it was. Um, I, I was learning every day, and I was a sponge. I, I really was a sponge. And I think that was when I first realized that coaching wasn't just X's and O's. It was about the environment. But most of all, it was also about leadership. And I think that, that, that you know, saying, having a vision and saying, this is where we're going. Great on the club side and more and more people got involved with us, you know. Um, but on the coaching side, it, it, I was having to learn to do that, you know, how to be a leader. I was going to say, like, what were your resources to kind of 
learn the game because of course if, if you're already the head coach it's not like you're working under someone and they're kind of and you're sort of watching them and, and picking up things from them right. like you've got to obviously actively go out and, and seek the information I, I assume so what was your process for actually developing yourself as a coach and uh, upskilling yourself I guess yeah no you're right you're certainly right about that quite a lot of coaches in mean, my recollection is quite a lot of coaches you know Joe, uh, Joe Welton Danny Danny Palmer, um, there were there were many others. I'm sorry, my I'm 74, Sam. Come on, you know the memory. Uh, but there were a lot of American coaches I was going up against. And to be absolutely frank, I I, I would I would try and talk. Obviously, what on Saturday night you're playing against them, you know, there's an element of that. So um, and ironically, didn't look to Europe so much. You know, it was always West. Uh, but that was the start of, the, of my idea that, uh, well, to get better, uh, I'd been going to the States for um, recruiting, like there was a summer league in L.A., uh, which I think may even still be operating, where we actually recruited Harvey, Harvey Knuckles from, from the Lakers. So I would go, be going over there, and that was rich with coaches. Pat Riley was sitting in the in the bleachers, you know, I remember him in front of me uh, before he became the head coach there. Um, but it was a rich um, a source because I would then talk to anybody I could, um, uh, you know, about about the whole the whole thing, what they were doing, the coaching process, uh, development of philosophies. But then I formalised that a bit later. Um, uh, actually, actually, even during that time now, I come to think of it, because uh, uh, I love the college game. I love the the, um, the NCAA uh, situ- more than the NBA, actually. Um, I remember I went to India. Uh, so anyway, what I used to do was to make contact with the head coaches. And this guy from England, who, you know, <laughs> basketball, do they play it over there, you know? Uh, and I was calling them up. And to be honest, I'm they're such generosity. I would go to programs and they would let me be a fly in the wall and I would sit down. I remember I was really interested in, in the ideas of the idea of controlling another team defensively, you know, with pressure. And uh, at that time, UNLV under Tuck Canyon were, was, were, they were famous for their pressure, pressure defense. And I went out to, um, he, I, I called him up and he, he, he bited me out there and I stayed out on the campus. I went through every practices. I went to games. I went on a scouting trip. But he had a young assistant called Tim Gergovich who became, uh, is now, in fact, he may still be in the NBA, but one of the greatest player development coaches. And they had an old guy. <laughs> they had Bud, Bud Presley from Menlo College who was a defensive specialist. And my God, I, I, that, I, the first practice I went to at UNLV, the first hour and a quarter, I'm sitting up in the bleachers. I just landed and went straight to UNLV. I'm sitting on the bleachers watching his first practice. Do you know, for the first hour and a quarter, the basketballs never came out. It was all movement fundamentals. Unbelievable, you know. And then I'm thinking, well, I can't do that in England. <laughs> you know, when I go back to England, guys got to learn to pass, shoot and dribble, you know. Um, but of that time, um, my experience at Indiana, I think this is well well known, you know, with Bobby, uh, with Coach Knight. I think uh, going, to that, going there was the first time I understood the idea of, of reading he's the greatest teacher in my opinion or one he was one of the greatest teachers uh, of the game and and i learned uh, about reading and and uh, and his his whole and, and the motion offense was people talk about motion offense now but you know the way he coached it was sensational never ran a, a set play in in all in, he won three national championships you know so it was a combination of those things and also taking youth teams out there. I, I, I took a team, um, a youth team out, and we played every um, team, every high school team in the, um, I can't remember, the, the Washington, D.C. area with DeMatha. 
teams like De Matha, St. John's, um, famous people. You know, we all had like Danny Ferry and people like that were playing on them. We didn't win a game until the last game. We actually won a game. We won one one game against these guys. But of course, I was talking to coaches. Um, Morgan Wharton is a legend, you know, uh, in, in there. And I'm sitting there in a cafeteria, you know, talking to him. And and he's he, he helped me. Why would, you know, why? I, he was so generous. We didn't get the ball over the halfway line in the first quarter against them, against the matter. And I had voices in, in this country say, well, why are you taking kids out there just to get thrashed, you know? Um, but I it balanced against that. Uh, the Lloyd, the Ware Rebels program, which I think we're going to talk about, but uh, we went out and to the to North, uh, UNC to North Carolina, and again, you know, Coach K at Duke and um, Dean Smith. So we were able to watch practices, and I was able to talk to assistant coaches. I was able to see the way Coach K spoke to his uh, spoke to his players. It was around the Christmas period, and I remember him worrying about the fact that there was going to be a break from practice. But the contrast between watching him and he still calls, he's, Bobby Knight is the only coach he calls coach. The only coach, because he obviously played under him, and he still, he still calls him that. But his coaching, I realised that coaching styles, you get it done with different coaching styles. He wasn't Bobby Knight. He didn't ate Bobby Knight. Completely different calm cool <laughs> you know you work with the guys and then say all right film room we go to the film room and then 10 minutes later they come back da, 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 da. And you go to coach night practice and that was a, that was a little different just like you say there like you know different coaches have got very different styles different philosophies things they focus yeah. on things they want to be known for or whatever or want their teams to be known for at what point did you sort of, I guess, decide upon a overriding philosophy that you'd want to, how you'd want to coach your teams, how you'd how do, how you'd want your teams to play? How how did you kind of go about, I guess, picking the bits that you like from different people and then putting it in with your own, adding your own flavour to it to come across, to come up with your own style of of coaching? Yeah, that's a great great question because, of course, even now I still I'm still a student. Uh, of the game and I, I did make my mind up that I was always going to try and stay current but I think it was forming and I was very influenced in the early days by by the um, the college experiences you know my, and the trips to and high school um, and actually we played a junior college as well with one of my original junior teams um, uh, which was interesting but I think they were really firming up um, at and there was a season, uh, actually, I, I coached Brunel. I remember this so well. I, I They had been in Division Two and won promotion, the, and for some reason the, the, the coach wasn't returning. And um, uh, they, they I, I, I was appointed there. Um, and then MD coach Dunning joined me a little bit later in the, in the season. But in that year... Um, th again, something happened in terms of my philosophy that a lot of things came to, uh, came together and I was beginning to feel... Uh, and to me, it was about how do you get um, a group of players to realise their potential? And it was in that year. It was a team that was expected to go up and come down. That That's what I was taking over. That's what I was told. They're going to go straight back down again. Um, you know, but I had two, uh, Dale Roberts and Brian Kellebrew, two, two wonderful guys, uh, two, two, two Americans. Martin Walters, um, sadly, has died now. Uh, Phil Ralph, kid out of Avenue under Lenny, Lenny Hoy. Um, and Dave Human, a, a workman, like, I think he had a sort of connection with Crystal Palace. But um, it was that team um, and what we achieved... Um, Ending up going to the going to the players, and this was the era of Kingston. You know, um, Coach Coach Cadle was there. This was nineteen eighty five, eighty six, right? Yeah, eighty five, yeah. eighty six. That's it. Um, I have trouble <laughs> remembering so, that. but it was yeah, around about there. And um, of course, uh, Portsmouth had a fully pro team. I think Dan was there, Dan Lloyd, and so on, and Danny. Um, 
who was the coach i'm trying to remember the coach but the 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 whole thing came down to one game for me in terms of realizing the potential of the, of that group i thought we played the right way a lot of my ideas about subtle changes in defense um about simplifying offense about reading uh, on offense all kind of came together and i i remember i remember this because we over celebrated it to be absolutely honest with you but we put on a friday night portsmouth who was a fully pro team joel moore you know play, players of that that a brilliant center uh, crime members remember name now but uh, colin irish and dan and so on that that sort of era uh they were in, in portsmouth and they were playing manchester who i think were then linked to manchester united you know they had a brief spell yep. uh with joe joe welton was the coach a terrific coach with jeff jones and so on and they had to go to manchester on the saturday to win for the title this is portsmouth fully pro team but on the way up <laughs> They played little old Brunel um, on the Friday night on on the way up. Uh, I mean, and damn me, we beat them, um, which meant that the game in on the Saturday, I think, in Manchester um, hurt their chances. Uh, I think it it might have cost them the league actually. Uh, but that I remember a couple of points. Maybe maybe they pressed us at the end, and we ran a press, very simple press break. Martin Walters makes a layup. People swamped the floor. All the students from Brunel would come out for games with those ridiculous duck whistles because we, we were called we were called the Brunel Ducks for God's sake. But uh, they came running on the floor. Uh, it was it was mayhem. Um, a game we sh- we shouldn't have won it, but it was. I think that's really when it clicked to me that that you know he, the in basketball. You've got the same access to the fundamentals of the game. You've got the same strategies and tactics and so on. And there are as many ways to coach this game as there are coaches almost. So it's about finding finding a way of playing. How do you maximize what you've got, minimize what, what they have? Uh, and, I, and I think that, that's when it clicked. It clicked for me. Uh, and the team in those days, we used to have a team of the year and the Brunel, although we we made the playoffs and got tonked in the, uh, who did we? I think we we played Kingston, I think, and got Britain beaten pretty badly. But we weren't expected to even be in the playoffs. But uh, I mean, for ironically, they got you know the team we were voted team of the year. And when you think about the teams that were around at that time, and I I was coach of the year, which is very flattering. But I credit Coach Dunning for that a lot as well because he was terrific he, he he was more than a system you know yeah um coach was was real was a really good uh good guy to have you you um you said there that you you, f- you think about kind of like uh the sort of the roster that you have uh and then sort of the way that you can play when it, when it comes to sort of the start of the season when you're talking about recruiting players are you recruiting players that were going to fit in the style that you want to play? Or do you recruit the roster first and then adapt your style of play and kind of the way you're going to play based on the players and assets you have? No, I mean, that's a fascinating thing. If you are in a situation, I guess some American colleges are actually, where you can recruit to a philosophy. If you're in that situation, great. I mean, going back to you and Alvi Tarkanian was that he would recruit athletes that could do do things. But no, I, I, I don't believe that. I, I, I think this, the art of coaching, the skill of coaching is having a group of players. And yeah, you would like you would like guys, guys that um, play the way you want to, you, you know, you, you'd like to play. But I think the skill of coaching is maximizing what what you have. In other words, adjusting your coaching style. You know, if you can't extend then don't extend. You know, if you can't play 90 feet, don't don't play 90 feet. If offensively, you know, offense isn't equal opportunity uh, in in my book. You know, if if you can't, if one, two, three guys can score in particular areas, then get them the ball in in those areas. It's a, it's a percentage. Uh, it's a game of percentages, isn't it? And uh, I, to me, it's a that's the coaching art. I think is is um you know being able to being able to recognize assess what you have 
versus what they have, what the uh, uh, opponent has. And I mean, I would even change things um, offensively. Um, I'll give you, the, uh, can I just give you one example? Okay. Uh, I, I don't want to bore you. No, no, <laughs> go for it. For, for instance, we're in the league and um, I can remember teams that, uh, who ran the break really well, ran, ran what well, people call it transition. I, I like to call it conversion from defense to offense. And, you know, you could, you, quite often they relied on a point guard, you know, on, a, on an outlet to a point guard and running it down the floor. So offensively, you can influence that. You can put, the, the one thing you can do when, when another team's playing man-for-man defense is you can dictate where they go on the floor. So we would, I would run their point guard down to the baseline offensively. Our point guard wouldn't be in the backcourt because that's where he wanted to be, the defensive point guard. So we would put, I would put, uh, run him down the back. Now, my, often I'd argue with point guards on my teams. I remember saying, uh, you know, and they said, well, no, I, I need to be out in the backcourt. I'll pressure the ball out in the back. Well, no, I want you here. Now you look at conversion which or transition, which is more important to the outcome of the game, both ways. What you do going back and what you do going forward is more important, in my opinion, than what you do in the half in the half court, either offensively or defensively. You look at how the influence that that has on a game. So I suppose that's that that's an example, and that that's pure learning from Bobby Knight. I mean that that uh, there's no question about that. So after your stint with Brunel, that was uh, after that eighty six to eighty nine was your involvement with the England senior senior men's program. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you kind of talk about sort of the teams that you were involved with, your experiences with the national team? Obviously, some some standout games. Um, you know, we know you played Turkey, Greece, uh, and then sort of some of the players on the team are former podcast guests that that I've spoken to. Um, you know, Paul Stimson, Mickey Bet. Um, yeah. Can you, yeah, kind of, do you remember the, the, the first time you got the call um, to sort of coach the England senior men, how, how that made you feel, I guess, the, perhaps the honour that, that you felt represent your country, and then sort of uh, your involvement with the England programme and how that was uh, when you compare it to sort of your experiences with the National League? Yeah, I, I, good times, bad times, I think, would be the way I'd sum that up. I think, um, and I actually did, you know, I looked at, I heard Paul and, uh, and um, Mickey talking about some things there. Here, here's the, the thing, but I got a call I was quite surprised, actually. I didn't even know why they were going to change the previous coach. But I, I got a call on, I think it was a Sunday morning, actually, I remember, and um, was offered the, the, the chance to coach. I'd always wanted to coach at the highest level I could, at the, at the elite level. So it, it, it was a flat-out honour. But, and here's the but, it was at a time when... Uh, the dual national passport player, you know, was becoming more and more prominent. And there were, I remember terrible conflicts and in my own mind, because I were, were these guys playing for the name on the front of the jersey, you know, the, those sort of things. And, and I was really inexperienced. I'd had a sharp learning curve, no question. I felt technically able uh, um, to do it. But um, it was those those um, uh, decisions about, uh, you know, which players to, to, to select, some of those selection decisions. And I made one or two really bad mistakes looking back. You know, I absolutely accept that. But, but equally, um, uh, there were some, uh, all right, we had some dual nationals, but we had the same preparation problems as almost still exist today, which is uh, disappointing. And I think you can only play to your talent level if you can't prepare. If you if you can prepare, then... But it isn't just a question of preparation. But uh, in terms of memorable things, I think um, in the end, um, we went to, to Turkey for the qualification um, uh, round to get into the semi-final round. Now, we'd never won the qualification tournament we're in a pool with turkey sweden scotland and england and we were frankly the the two also runs we expected i think to go home you know and sweden and turkey to um qualify and um as it turned out you know we beat uh, scotland 
We beat Sweden, who were, were actually, I, I loved their team and I loved the way they played. But nevertheless, we, we, um, we beat them. And we ended up in a situation where we were playing Turkey in Istanbul in an arena that used to be where bear fighting went on. They, they, it was concrete stand. You know, con- they were all standing, the crowd. They were not seats. They were all standing on these concrete terraces. It was, it was pretty, pretty frightening. But anyway, um, I remember before the game, the, I shook hands with the Turkish coach. And I think the deal was that they had to beat us by four to qualify. I'm pretty sure we were either going to win or come second, and we would qualify, having beaten Sweden. And so he shook my hand and then held on to it and pulled me in. And he said, uh, Coach, um, maybe we both qualify. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my introduction to international basketball, you know. So now was we throw the game, they qualify, we qualify. I think that was the inference. But anyway, it was fantastic. I remember preparing that game and, and again, changing what we were going to do defensively. Um and hanging it and hanging on when when they were making a run, their guards were really real good, you know, um, making a run. But uh, as you, I think you've been told before, you know, Dave Gardner ends up on the free throw line. My memory is that she was hit just below the eye because I think he had a cut just below the eye. He makes the first free throw and then gets hit. And the interesting thing from a coaching point of view was then he walked towards the halfway line, looking over to the bench, sort of his eye, and it was beginning to bleed. And, of course, as a coach, I had the option of replacing a, a free throw shooter uh, through injury. And I had Paul Stimson on the bench, just an incredible um, shooter, you know, free throw shooter, particularly his percentages were ridiculous. So I'm thinking, and then Dave taught me, here we go, another lesson. Dave looked across to me and waved his hand. No, no, let him... He was angry. Obviously, he went back to the line and just drained it, absolutely drained it. And then, and they're all our memories, sort of riot police. And uh, there were sticks. I've got, I've got video of it. There are sticks, stones, coins, um, all sorts coming down, uh, raining down. And the the noise, the whistling, and the noise was deafening. And we had to go through a tunnel. And as we go to the tunnel, I'm behind Colin Irish. It was, it was a big boy, bigger than me, and they're punching him in the neck. They're leaning over the thing. It was, it was good times, bad times, they say. We get in the changing room. We're sitting around there. I was thrilled, obviously, because we're going to the semifinals of the Euro, European Championships, you know. I, I, I was just thrilled, and um, the wonderful, wonderful players that, uh, that I had, great guys I had, and... We're there, and then a brick. We're in the changing room, and a brick. Fortunately, it had bars on the on the window. A brick hits the the window, smashes it. We're close where the showers were. I'm pretty sure we were held in the changing room for some, you know, uh, maybe it seems like to me now an hour, and then we needed a sort of white helmeted police to to uh, escort us back to the hotel, which was. You know, across uh, across the road, where the, the Swedish coach uh, met me, a uh, smashing guy. I don't even remember his name now, but he was a great guy, and uh, was very appreciative of me because, of course, they qualified in second place. Wow. And Turkey are like 14th or 15th in the world now. Um, and of course, the other game was uh, the other standout was. Um, I mean, we beat Germany for the first time ever. The first time we'd ever done that. Um, because after we qualified, we suddenly had the association um, contact me. They were suddenly getting a rash of invitations to go and play these sort of much more higher ranked teams. I mean, I'll give you an idea. We we went to, we played China, Greece. I made a note here. Greek, I'll tell you about the Greece Greek game. Germany, Spain, Holland, Czechoslovakia, who we beat. Again, having uh, you know beaten them once before, Finland, Hungary, Belgium, Turkey, Iceland, who GB lost to you know uh, fairly recently, we beat them. Actually, coached by uh, Laszlo. Laszlo Nemes was coached them at the time until he did such an incredible job with England. And the USSR were out in Lithuania playing 
in a tournament with China, Russia, or I think they were the USSR then. And, um, well, it was like a pan-American select uh, American team. Um, I think I, I'm not quite sure how they, but I'm, I, I'm there and there's Gromolsky, the Russian coach and uh, some famous players, famous uh, guys. But so that came after us qualifying. So we got all of these, these invites. Um, but I think the, 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 the Greek game really, on the one hand, I've got really fond memories from because we, we, we were beaten out there. We played them the first game after they became European champions. They'd beaten Russia in the European Champions. So we'd beaten them in 81, I think, England had, uh, in an historic win um, under Vic Ambler. And, uh, but then the next few years, they got very, very good. And then they won the European Championships. And so we're going out to play them in Greece and their European champion, the first game. They, and I'm afraid we were slightly embarrassed out there. So we put the ball on the floor too much, all, all of those sorts of things. So we came back. I got a basketball. I ripped it open, stuffed it with, with rags, taped it up. We practiced at Crystal Palace. No dribble in, in preparation for the home game. Greek television, all the advertising at Crystal Palace was Greek. was Greek. The place was packed. It was carried live on Greek television. They didn't have Gali, the the, um, the 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 guard, so they were slightly slightly weak, and they still had they still had Pasuda and players that were you know fringe NBA and so on, and Yanakis who coaches in the uh, Euro League now, and um, I always remember a ball screen and um, uh, uh, Jeff Jones comes off in knocks a jump. We're up at half time against the European champions, and. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, seriously, we we should we can win this. We really can win this. Um, Fasula, who was guarding Mike Spade, wouldn't wouldn't come out of the key. So Mike was shooting from outside, making shots, you know. Um, and actually, we we had shots that rimmed and stuff. That if they had gone down, we 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 would have won. But uh, in the second half, there was a three minute period. I always remember it where Yanakis, um, um very talented guard, kind of took the game, took the game over. Uh, it was amazing, actually, um, disappointing from our, our point of view. But um, I'm not, I could, you know, I, my, I'm thinking it was about an eight points, something like that. I don't know whether you've looked at the record book, but I don't, it I don't was something it. like that. But it was a close, it, relatively uh, uh, close loss. Um, but on selection, I've got regrets. I don't want to embarrass the uh, player, but I made one terrible mistake. Um, I wrangled over it. I remember long burning the midnight oil with um, with Dave, with Dave Ransom, and, and I really regret that uh, I didn't include a certain player who's become an absolute legend in the game in 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 that team. But I guess you know all experiences are are learning experiences. So that period, and then um, I got a letter from the association saying that um, this was after Turkey, saying that the results were some of the best ever achieved by England. Very flattering, very, very, uh, very uh, rewarding, very nice, you know. But then I end up uh, meeting with them, uh, with them uh, about the future, and there was absolutely no plan, no. No plan for extra resources. No, the the program we would be continuing the way we'd continue that we had had, you know, no training or very little preparation time, meeting at airports and going out to play, and I was, uh, uh, it was more important to me at that time. Not not just being the England coach, it was more important to me that, that, that the program would go somewhere. You know, we were on the way up. That was my feeling at the time. Um, and I, I resigned. I, I just, you know, I, I just disappointingly couldn't, couldn't, uh, uh, you know, I, I just didn't, didn't feel that uh, it was going in the, in the right direction. I mean, fortunately after that, even greater talent was brought in and we, and we, 
again england did okay and this was all before the gp stuff you know i've gone on a bit no no that's that's no it's perfect super interesting <laughs> um the so so after after that you come back that was you did a you did a year of thames valley was it a year uh, no more than a year uh, sorry four no, years a couple, yeah a couple of uh, i was around back to the commercial thing i i was much more i, I couldn't coach properly there i, I mean I, I was back they wanted a the commercial side run yeah. and it was the salary cap and the owner was absolutely every penny you know uh, so it was tough but um i i i didn't um i was the wrong guy in, in that situation this was in the bbl as well right in the bbl yeah yeah so this yeah. would have been your first experience in the bbl uh because yes, the bbl would have been formed in 87 so uh, yeah actually rather than the forerunner yeah, yeah. exactly how, how do you yeah. think the BBL compared, obviously, being your first experience sort of uh, yeah. with this newly formed league that had been from a, you know, a bunch of clubs that wanted to break away and sort of be more in control of their own destiny, as, as Bob Hope always put it. How did you find yes. um, sort of the league? Did you, did you find it, it, it had done the things that they wanted it to do in terms of um, increasing the professional, professionalism of the game um, and increasing the level of it? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was of course, early days, um, clearly, um, but yeah, I thought um, I thought I, I, it was inevitable to compare it with what had happened in the eighties. But I yeah, I, I, I thought it was um, it was quite exciting because there was devolution, you know. And I was involved in some of those early meetings that I remember Bob talking, Bob Home talking about, you know, where the clubs were, how how everything could run. Um, but yeah, from a from a technical level. Um, I, uh, I think I think we must have come third or something in the in the second year. I, 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 it was all a bit of a blur for me at that time. But uh, the standard was 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 good. Yeah, uh, was good and was clearly including. But the 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 um, I think uh, Kevin, you know, Cadle's group at um, at Kingston. Um, I think they they were the shining lights in the in the team. You know, the quality of that. Of that group was uh, terrific and the way they played and you know in terms of coaching you think about kevin uh, and and you know, i think leadership was as much a part of his um talent as, as x's and o's you know and so after thames valley um it was the where rebels did the sort of the junior the junior program now now yeah obviously it was very successful it was where you where you had your first undefeated season i, I feel like um you know, when I speak to various people, when they talk about sort of legendary junior programs, where is it, where goes under the radar a little bit uh, from that radar yeah, from that era compared to sort of the, you know the London Towers and your East London Royals and uh, sort of I guess the the, the more sort of London based clubs. Um, yeah. One of the interesting things I sort of noted that you said about uh, that period with where is that it sort of um, confirmed your beliefs that you had around sort of junior development um, and everything around that. Can you kind of explain sort of that experience, uh, what it did for you and, and why you decided to sort of go into focus on the juniors um, after, I guess, previously having been more heavily involved with, with senior programs? Yeah, um, it, it was, uh, it was a bit cathartic, I think, after Thames Valley, but I was really interested in um, what was happening in, in junior in junior ball and uh, yeah, as you say these programs you know london big big city programs sort of thing and and where and where that was going and uh, and going back to the idea of realizing the potential of groups i i you know there were a bunch of kids in the where area you know which wasn't wasn't very big and we were going up against those teams i think some of them had longevity which is why you hear more more about them. To, I, I'm not down, down to denigrate them at all, but um, but the Ware program it was both technically really interesting because I could use um, the read and react stuff, you know, offensively, and we weren't particularly athletic. I think I think we would uh, we'll put it uh, we'll put it that way. But but um, uh, there was uh, they developed an understanding of them, and I took them from 14 years old. From 14 to 18 years, I, uh, to 18 years old, I took a, a group which pretty much stayed the same from there to there, um, and you know, uh, yeah, by by the I think it was the third year that we had the um, we had the undefeated year, you know, um, and we were beating um, we were beating these teams, Manchester and the London, uh, you know, 
the London teams. That's, I think at that time it was under 17 and under 19, as, as I recall. Um, but that, unde- that undefeated season uh, and the titles um, that we won, I think, I think for me, it just illustrated that, again, so many different ways to, uh, to coach the game. Um, and, uh, you know, the final um, against London Towers with um with dear joe joe wide who i admired you know enormously and of course carbs tony tony garbetta was coaching but we 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 had a, a just a fantastic final four playoffs there and we ended up playing playing um london towers with some you know that olu and a lot of talent and i just looked at you looked at them and you looked at us it was a a bunch of kids um but you know, we played the way I like to play, and uh, we won one by five. It was the closest game we'd had all year, um, but we, we, you know, we won by five. And then the following year, um, we were able to include Uncle Ogilvy, you know, um, uh, who's got on in in the lineup because of the age situation, and and he trained with us in the in that year. Um, and we again, you know, we ended up winning the. We kind of, we kind of dominated under seventeen, I think. Although we didn't meet London Towers regularly in the league, sort of thing. But we won all the other things. And then in the uh, these the yeah the under nineteen year, so to speak, we beat um, a Jack Majewski's. He had a, he had a wonderful team. Um, really, really good kids. Um, Is that his and, Ealing side? It yes, it yes, it was Ealing. Ealing. Yeah, um, uh, and Jack, Jack is a great character, great motivator, and those boys, goodness me, had some some names that went on, you know, to, to play. And, who, who were um, some of the names that of those players that, that that you were bringing through? Obviously, Lloyd Gardner was was one of them who GB, yeah. went on to GB assistant. Obviously, most recently coaching London City Royals. Who were some of the other players that were part of that group that that you coached all the way through? Well, I think um, uh, the, the I mean the guy I quote is Lee Lee Miles, who um, is now in Australia and coaching, so he's still involved. In, you know, he's still involved in the game. He was a great soccer player, would have been a soccer player, but I picked him up for a tryout once and in St Albans where he lived, and um, you know he he was he, both he and Lloyd I think were the the standards, and then of course Duncan Doogie we called him um, when he came in he made a um, uh, there was another lad, um, Danny uh, Beeston, uh, who's a, 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 a big kid who was, I say, predominantly local. I, I, I'm not sure. I think about nine of them were at the same school, which, uh, needless to say, won the school's championships. You know, <laughs> but uh, um, it, it just proved to me that you could take a group, you could take a group of young players, and 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 find a way to play that suited them. We certainly couldn't go down the floor, you know. Um, but I also had a responsibility to expose them to the what they might go on to do. So I had to expose them about, you know, breaking down zones and, and how to play. We changed defences. Uh, and we, we ran a break. But, of course, Lloyd, Lloyd was a, already by that time was a pretty impressive point guard. So... So after you'd done where... That was, you did your stint with England Juniors as well, right? Yes, yeah. How was that? And then you know, of course, one of the one of the names that you coached was Drew Sullivan, uh, who, yeah. whenever I ask people who their uh, something to name sort of the, some of the top British junior players that they remember, Drew's name consistently comes up as one of the greatest junior players they've, they've ever seen. Kind of, what was he like as a talent? What was it like to coach him? And I guess um, sort of wrapping up with your your kind of experience with with the England juniors as well. Well, I I'd had two spells. I'd had a previous spell way back. Okay. Well, I went went to Mannheim with um, I think Morris Wordsworth was okay. the was the coach, and we were playing we played against an American team with some like uh, I think five of them ended up in the NBA, you know <laughs> that sort of thing. But anyway, uh, but this uh, again very disappointing. There was no resource available for that junior team, but we did go to a tournament out in in Belgium and. Um, uh, which the England team had gone to, and it was the first time I really hooked up with Mark Lloyd, uh, Lloydy, whose dad John Lloyd had been my England senior mentee manager, 
and I met with him, which is a lifelong friendship now with, with Lloyd. He was, he was he flat out probably the best team manager. Well, not probably, he is the best international team manager this country's ever had, I think, with all due respect to everybody else. Um, but um, we, we, and we went out to Belgium. And I remember um, Drew being on that, uh, on that team and they, we got to the final, we played a Belgian team I can't remember who, who they were, but uh, we, we played a Belgian team anyway in the final, and uh, they had run, they'd beaten everybody pretty well. We we ended up winning by a margin, and the the game was broken open by Drew, who you know could play around the bucket, but he came down I think on three consecutive breaks, pulled up on the three point line, and I'm looking at the floor, <laughs> thinking no. <"Nah." laughs> You know, the classic. And he just knocked down, just knocked down these shots. And I realized that, you know, um, well, I didn't realize, I think I pretty much knew he could play anywhere on the floor, you know. Um, <clears throat> so talented. I'd had to coach against him uh, going back in the in the day in the, at the junior level, the very young level, the 14-year-old level, you know. Yeah. Fortunately, I think he went to the States. <laughs> he saved us, you know. But he, he was wonderful. I'm terrible with names. I, I You know, there, there were other players on that yeah. uh, on that team, you know. But, yeah, but Drew was the standout, no question. But so, no resources. Yeah. England, again, no. Common theme, zero. a common theme. Yeah. Um. So, uh, Great Britain Wheelchair Basketball Association and being involved with, with wheelchair basketball, and obviously that, that, that represented a, quite a switch, well, I, I assume. Like, how, how different do you find it is you know, coaching um, wheelchair basketball in, in comparison to able-bodied basketball? Uh, what made you decide to kind of make that jump? And, of course, you know, some of the experiences you had with them, uh, Paralympics and winning medals and, and everything else. Of course, I feel like the success of the the great britain wheelchair basketball team is is pretty underrated um because they've been an absolute powerhouse uh for years but absolutely yeah can you kind of talk about that that sort of transition yeah. for you and, and your involvement with them i'd absolutely agree with that um and now let me say straight away that i i remember what when the way it happened was i had a player that i'd coached as junior tony woolard uh sadly passed now but he he um he was in a terrible, he played able body basketball, but he was in a terrible uh, motorbike accident, very badly injured. And anyway, um, they, they uh, the wheelchair game of GB team were fantastic. You know, they'd done really well. And then there was a bit of a slide for whatever reason. I, I don't, I don't really know the background, but they were sliding outside of, uh, they'd been a European, they'd won a European championship medal and got world-class performance funding uh, from the lottery. And then they were sliding out um, of the top end. And anyway, he called me, he was on the committee and asked whether I would apply. They had an you know, interview process to be the Great Britain head coach of the Paralympic team uh, before Sydney, coming up to Sydney. I had never, I had rarely seen wheelchair basketball, um, let alone coached it. I hadn't coached it. And initially... Um, I must say some of some coach, some people around coach were a little bit sniffy, you know, about it, um, which was disappointing because it was a life enhancing period for me um, because the uh, uh, once he I, I got the job and I suddenly realized that I saw nothing but the similarities, first of all. You know, the baskets were the same height, the, the floor was the same size, the ball was the same, everything was the same. But when I got involved with it, I spent three months studying the game. The first thing I did was just study the game for three months, day in, day out. And then, of course, I realized all of the differences. But particularly at the international level, it's a fantastic game. I, I could not believe some of what, you know, when I looked at teams like Canada and America, Australia, <clears throat> they were, I mean, you sat side uh, on the court sideline and you just stopped seeing the chairs. I mean, it, it just, it was just incredible to me, but th th it was very restrictive. Clearly, you know, you didn't teach footwork, you teach chair work, how, how to do things. And, and of course there were, there were differences. So I, I, we, w we were going to go to uh, Sydney. That's what they, I had a nine month contract 
um, they had world-class performance funding. And I say it now, but though that period, I think it was about eight years, I was part of world-class performance programs, which GB Able Bodied or, or Able Body would have died for. You know, I could look at practice at um, uh, you know how to create world-class environments, performance environments from the best in the world. I could look around because I was I was still looking at Able Bodied. In fact, I ended up still coaching Able Bodied at Reading, but. Uh, I, it, it's purely selfish, but I had to learn it in order to write the world-class performance plan and to get the, the continual funding. But I always remember that we went to Sydney um, for the uh, nine months after I first walked into Lillishaw to the training camp, never coached the game, sort of thinking, what am I going to do? I've never coached the game. I had a great assistant coach who, who really taught me everything. And um, we went to, we, we prepared, and I, and I tried to professionalize what they were doing. That was the key problem. They, that even though they had all the funding, um, you know, the guys were very few guys from, there was only one guy with any sort of um, background in able-bodied basketball. So um, I felt that they, the whole thing needed, there needed to be a whole change of um, environment, let's say. So I try to professionalize everything and introduce standards that we wouldn't fall below and all this sort of thing. Um, so we did that in a very short time and just unbelievable. I pushed them. Some of the things were just outright cruel. I mean, you know, we'd be up at 6 a.m. at Lillishaw pushing a two mile hill. Um, the kids, the guys in before breakfast, you know, um, and then we would have train all day. I mean, some of the demands physical, uh, physically that, uh, that we made were unbelievable, but they rose to it. They absolutely rose to it. Talk about triumph over adversity, you know, unbelievable. So we go to Sydney and we end up in the, in the, uh, we'd, we'd lost to teams, you know, we'd have pre-season games against Germany and Australia and all, and we'd lost to them, quite a lot of them. But we I changed some things. Anyway, we get to Sydney and we end up in the in the bronze medal game. And UK Sport had said, you've got to win a medal at the, medal at the Paralympics for your world class funding to continue. Medal, you know, money in, medal out. That was the formula. Um, so we're, we're there and we're, we miss a layup with a few seconds left in the game to win it against... Um, the USA and they get the ball to just over the halfway line and short a guy called Schultz throws it up from there and it goes in <laughs> and he makes a shot from there from a chair it, it just unbelievable 19,000 people watching the game in Sydney on the same floor where the dream team had played you know <laughs> anyway that he makes the shot so we we come forth and that's not good enough you know uh we think but anyway long story short we we get back to england i'm thinking that's the end of my contract you know and um uk sport come back and said well great britain clearly has potential has podium potential i think was the way they put it so uh, from then on we rolled our sleeves up and uh um you know i I just learned every day in that in that job. I mean, just the just the the wonderful opportunities that I had to learn from programs around the world, and also to learn and to respect the the, the wheelchair game. Um, and frankly, you know what GB have done. They've now gone on. They're dominant in the world now. Uh, have an unbelievable coach, um, a great coach, completely different coaching style to my own. Um, but it, they're incredible. And in my period, we then went on and um, we had um, we won. We went to the world championships. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, got a silver medal. You know, we won the bronze in Athens, played the most beautiful game of wheelchair basketball. Um, we, were, we, were, we were up there in the top three or four all the time, you know, with with Australia and uh, Canada. Canada were particularly dominant at this period. And then in the Paralympic World Cup, um, we played Australia in the final. And this was kind of like the end for me, really. Well, I mean, I stayed on a little while longer, but um, 
and we played Australia, and um, we made a shot from near the halfway line to go into overtime. And then Adi Depatan, who's well known now as a TV presenter particularly, but he was an excellent wheelchair player, wheelchair basketball player, makes two free throws at the end of overtime um, to win. Uh, to, to you know to uh, uh, win the the Paralympic World Cup so uh, get the gold medal and, and actually I should say that the loss in Sydney to the Americans we ended up playing them in the quarterfinals in Athens against the Americans can you believe and we beat them and I just broke down and cried you know wow. Um, wow. Adia Depitan makes two free throws Wow. Yeah, I mean, yeah, amazing. Yeah, and uh, 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 the thousands watching the games. Yeah. Massive stadiums. Unbelievable. What do you think you were able to take from uh, that experience, which you were then able to bring back to able body basketball, which kind of, I guess, improved your coaching or helped you as a coach? Um, two main things. Because, of course, originally I thought I could bring able bodied ideas into, which I did to a certain extent into the wheelchair game but i think um i think it was the first time um i just really truly understood about excellence about what it takes to create um winning environments that that was uh, really helped inform me and i think um of course i learned an awful lot about disability and uh, th- those sorts of things but in terms of coming back to um you know to um able body coaching um um, well, actually, of course, I was. There was a period out there I was coaching both. I was yeah. coaching running, which I know we're going to talk about. But, um, but I think it was creating the environment and um, uh, leadership, because it doesn't matter what you could be coaching Canadian log rolling, you know, if you if, if you understand the process. Yeah, I think those are the two things. So, let's. I'm aware of time here. So, the, the, yeah, the thing we, have to, we have to talk about is is the the Reading undefeated season. Um, which is what, two, was it 2008, 2009? Um, eight, nine, yeah. Yeah, 2008, 2009. You won everything that was, a, which was a quadruple. Yeah, quadruple. Yeah, there were four. Yeah. Um, th- was it 36 no over the course of, over the course of the year? Kind of, what were your memories of that season? Um, sort of going into it, what were your expectations? You know, was it something that you'd set as a target or were you pleasantly surprised as the season went on? <laughs> um, kind of, yeah, how did it, how did it all play uh, out? I, I think the latter. You know, the the one thing that uh, my time at Reading was terrific because the one thing there was the Johnson, Matt Johnson and Gary uh, Johnson, um, who ran the club, they had an understanding about coaching. And, you know, if I were a club owner now, I would, I would, the first position I'd fill would be the head coach who understood leadership, you know. But um, that year, that particular year, I felt when we recruited Tintin Watts, um, uh, and I saw him practice. I, I knew we could be competitive. We we didn't have the the best. I don't think we had the best roster in the in, in the league. To be absolutely frank, we had a really good roster, and it was bolstered. We had five or six senior players, and it was bolstered with with Matt's um, junior um, uh, program players. You know, um, but we had you know um, Tintin. We had Wally. You know, Wally Manu, Mamuni. Uh, a couple of really, really good um, uh, Americans that kind of complemented each other. But uh, I, again, it, it, it was it was a culmination, if you like, of the previous six or seven years. We'd gone up, you know, we'd won something every year. Um, but so much was about the creating the environment in terms of practice and so on that I'd learned from my time on the World Class Performance Programme. Uh, so, yeah, obviously, as the year went on, we won game, games in overtime. I think we won games from the free throw line. We won. Um, we had injuries. You know, Tintin was hurt. I remember in one very big game, but we, we, we found a way, that sort of thing. Um, but but most of all, it solidified, I think, um, the, the, the challenge of maximizing your talent, maximizing what you have. That sounds really pious and slightly big-headed, but uh, uh, but I but I think that that's what I I learned from that. 
Um, but I, I was, and the other great thing about it was I just coached. I, my whole time at Reading, they just wanted me to coach and develop the program. So I had no commercial responsibilities and they were fantastic for that. Yeah. And the other thing is the, the your season in, in Worthing um, in the BBL, uh, yeah. 2009-2010. So what was that? That was... So that would have been the, the season after you went undefeated with Reading. Yes. You, yeah. you decided to leave. Was, was that your decision? You wanted to leave and then sort of coach in the BBL or like kind of yeah, how, yeah. how did that there, come there about? Was, yeah, yeah. I know there was a, a big element of that. I sort of fell. And again, slightly, um, I don't know, uh, 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 slightly getting, getting above myself a little here. But I sort of felt, well, I wanted a new challenge, yeah. you know, that uh, really uh, we'd Go won everything. Top. Yeah. Go out sort on of, top. Yeah. 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 There was an element of that. I loved the Worthing Club anyway from being down there. They'd had one year in the BPL and uh, I think, you know, it struggled a little bit. And a number of people, they were interviewing for it. And um, so I thought I would I would go, you know, I would, I would give it a try and, and see, see what I could bring to them. Um, and again, there there's a management that understood that, you know, the value of the of, of coaching and um and in the end um it was <laughs> an interesting team you know <laughs> to have reggie bratton and kd and uh finnish guy villa and uh and some other guys but um uh we ended up uh i'm kind of disappointed in in a sense i was expecting um i think we had the second lowest budget and, and that's not, I'm, I'm not, uh, that's not uh, sort of um, any criticism of them because it was a wonderful club um, and wonderful people and they treated me really well. But we ended up beating every team in at least once in the BBL and in fact beating Newcastle twice. They absolutely whipped our behinds in the playoffs. <laughs> you know, I think there was a element of revenge there, but we 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 did after all beat them twice, uh, close games both games, and the only team we lost to was Tony Garbs' team at Everton, um, and he 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 did such such a terrific job, uh, just out coached the hell out of me, you know, in that in those games. So, anyway, um, uh, it it. It was an experience that, that uh, I didn't go, I couldn't go back. I mean, the travel was a big issue because I was still living in Hemel. The plan was, Lynn and I were seriously thinking of re relocating to the South Coast. Um, but in the end, I um, I didn't, I don't know, I just, I, the, the league, the league seemed to be more and more composed of, of imports of one kind, you know, one kind or another. I know there was some British talent in there as well, obviously, but um, it was kind of, it was a little bit disappointing as, as, a, as an experience, I think. Um, but the, the high, obviously the, the Newcastle games, but we had to go to Plymouth at the end of the season down, and of course, fantastic atmosphere, all that stuff down there. And it was actually Gary's last game, Gary Strong's last game. And um, one of, again, one of those games went down, and we set up some trap or whatever. Anyway, we come out with the ball, and Reggie knocks it down, and we we end up going into overtime. We don't go to the playoffs unless we win it, and we ended up winning it. We beat, we win it going away, seven, eight, nine points. So we go into the playoffs, and could look forward to the thrashing at uh, <laughs> Newcastle, you know. <laughs> so, but again, just a, a, a great experience because of the people. And the players um, who I loved, you know, they, yeah. they they were all very good with me, yeah. And then to kind of your, your the last the last uh, sort of club stint of your career uh, was with Hemel Hemel Storm, um, yeah. I guess kind of almost going back to the same sort of place where it, where it all started, coming full circle. Um, exactly. How, how was that kind of? I guess to 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 round out your your time with clubs, um, and how do you look back on your your time with the Storm? It was across Division Two and Division One, right? Yeah, I, I I thought we would give it a go. You know, it was 2010, and uh, it was 17 years or something since it, since basketball had been there or longer, and um, so 
uh, we were in division. There was a franchise um, that, that we were able to move to Hamill Division Two. I, on a personal level, I was getting to the point where I was more interested in mentoring than than in uh, actually the week in week out coaching. But nevertheless, I, I wanted us to get back to Division One. So we had a first year in Division Two, and I coached that. And then the second year, we won promotion um, into uh, Division One, uh, and then. Um, a year in Division One, but by now we were really looking to. Um, I, I was anyway. I was. I, I was really looking to step away. Um, I did towards the end of it have some health issues. I, I'm diabetic, and I, you know, I had some issues with my eyes. Um, so I think um, you know the coaches. We brought other um, coaches in, but now of course, I mean, la- last year was terrific. I mean, there are a lot of good people there running the club and I and I sort of I sort of uh, draw, drawn a line sort of under that I, I I'm much more involved now in, in mentoring um, but at least it's still being played it's now being played back in you know back in Hevel, Hamel at a decent level so uh, yeah there was definitely a feeling of coming full circle but I do you know I really think that once once I've got I, we won promotion and uh, we'd won a couple of patrons cups and we'd gotten gotten them into the first division. It was almost a case of me think looking around and thinking, well, you know, um, I I love working with other coaches and, and in this mentoring type of role. Uh, at that time, I, I actually oil paint, so I had other interests uh, looming. Um, so I think that that uh, it, it's left in a really good state. Uh, and, and and it's going to go. It's going to grow now. So let's talk about your involvement with the game now. Like you said, kind of obviously you you retired, but you're 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 taking up a mentoring role with, with other coaches. What exactly does that involve? And I guess who who are you mentoring? Oh, it's it's really informal. I'm not sure that <laughs> there's some GB guys uh, um, that I'm talking with, um, uh, and also um, I've just done a presentation to all the East Region. Uh, coaches but it's all it's all sort of obviously with the current situation and i'm i guess i'm in that high risk group um so i've been self-isolating for quite some time um so a lot of it's done you know on the phone or skype or whatever uh, uh, and i i you know, i'm talking to to coaches um and i just get calls like or, or emails or oh, i'd love to sit down and have a coffee could we sit down and and do that you know i know i know i'm due with with uh with alan you know alan keeney and 20 uh, and 20 coach i want we want to talk about motion and uh, uh but uh, it, it's it's the country needs more and better coaches that's that's the bottom line so i've always uh, always felt that so while there have been vast improvements i think in the technical development and so on um, if I can help in any way, you know, uh, I'll do it. Uh, I'll do it. But, um, you know, there's a new generation of, of young coaches now coming through. And I, I, I but I would I'd be always happy to hear from somebody that wants, you know, I, I, I had an email there recently from Lee, from Lee Miles, who's coaching out in Australia. You know, absolutely fantastic. Uh, one of my former guys, and of course, Lloyd. Um, uh, coaching at the or well, was coaching obviously in the VBL, um, but um, that's that's the way I feel now. I, at seventy four, I kind of feel I want to, I want to. Um, I, I got a back seat from the day to day stuff, but I'd love to go once it's safe. You know, I'd love to go into into programs and maybe you know do a little bit um, on the floor with some coaches or just work with the coaches in terms of coaching philosophy and. And that sort of thing. One of the things that's, that's clear to me is just how important coaches are for the development of the game. And, you know, it's said yeah. repeatedly just how, well, first of all, how, how few we don't have enough. Um, but also then the level of the ones that we do have uh, is not high enough. Like we, we need to improve the level of coaching. We need to Absolutely. better develop coaches. Um, if you were tasked with, you know, being being responsible for improving uh, sort of both the quantity and quality of coaches that we have across the UK, where would be uh, the places that you would start? What what things would you be looking at putting in places to kind of try and help drive coaching forward? Well, I think 
the, the first thing is that obviously the European, you know, the coaching badge, the, the well, coaches in Europe generally, they have to go through a far more rigorous, far more rigorous um, process, you know, study process than than uh, our guys do. But our guys, you know, we do, you know, let's not shortchange ourselves. There are coaches now developing technical knowledge and so on. Look, at, we're looking east now more perhaps than we than in my era looking uh, looking west. But the but I think. There's still this evangelical thing at the lower the lower levels, but I would I would want eight centres around the country. You'd want to put full time coaches in there. You'd want uh, coaches that are um, that technically are really are really talented and and new and new not not just the X's and O's but new the science of coaching the art of coaching, um, and I do think that that's the progress being made, but. But the sports profile, I mean, you, you know, doesn't exactly encourage our coaches are are, are succeeding despite that was that would be my uh, and it's so disappointing to see, you know, British coaches who are so frustrated with what they're doing now. Obviously, the academy system is fantastic. That's a beginning. We are at the beginning of 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 coach um, development, but. We need to we need to have a GB coaching manual, you know. We need. I mean, I wrote one for the G for the wheelchair uh, game, you know, a coaching manual. Um, but I, I think we need one for for GB uh, for for coaching in this country uh, that's at a level that would get some sort of serious recognition. You know, I mean, they're they're at degree level. Fever is a you know some of those things are degree level. You have to. You know, to qualify, you have to do an awful lot of things. You know, uh, in terms of experience and being assessed and so on. But I think I think that's that's where I start more and better, uh, and identify identify people whether whatever sport they're involved in, are they a good good coach? You know, I mean, Dave Brailsworth, you know, the cycling guy. <laughs> Look what he did at cycling, and I studied that incidentally for environment. But he's a great coach. Yeah, you know, why? Why isn't he coaching in in basketball? Finally, I remember a few years ago you saying you were working on a technical coaching book. Is that is that still something that you you you're hoping to do and and wanting to publish? <laughs> yeah, um, it, it it keeps changing because the games the games change, and it got a little bit anecdotal to be honest with you. You know, um, uh, and I, I started writing little headings and stuff, and then and then I started thinking, well. You see, the thing about the game technically is that there are so many, there are fads and and so on. So you could write a book today uh, about positionless basketball, about about spacing and about the, the influence of Europe in, into the NBA, for instance. And, you know, now the ball screen is, is predominant, whereas at one stage people didn't like it because it brought defense to the ball all those sorts of things. So I think the only way to do it is to say, to write something where you have choices. You know, you say, coach, look, these are the sorts of, like, you can guard the pick and roll seven ways or something, you know. I think that would, but I mean, that's a life's work. Yeah. I don't know, I've got that long. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, no, I keep saying, I must, I I would, I would like to, to, uh, to, you know, I did a presentation uh, up in uh, for for BE at the beginning of last season, I think it was, and about see, about teaching kids to see not just not just the physical aspects, but the importance of it and so on. And I do think there are some things. So maybe an article or two, but I don't know whether the, uh, the basketball, according to Coach Titmus, will ever will ever make the shelves. Well, if you ever <laughs> want to write an for article asking. for if you ever want to write an article for Who's Fix about about coaching by all means, I will more than happily publish it. So. Uh... We should definitely, right, yeah. definitely stay in touch on that. Thank you. Coach T, uh, that is awesome. Uh, we've gone almost an hour and 40, uh, so we'll wrap it up nice. there. But, yeah, thank you so much for, for taking the time. Super insightful, super enjoyable, uh, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate what you're doing, Sam, for the game. Thank you.